Greetings, and welcome to this very special edition of the Career Cafe. I'm your host, per usual, Dr. Troy Podell, and with me today is a very special guest, former active duty United States Navy, Steve Curley. Steve, thank you so very much for being with us today. The pleasure is mine, Troy. And uh, you, you've suffered my company a couple of times now, and this is I the have. first time we've, we've been able to, to get together mm -hmm. uh, for internet land. And um, Steve, I, I'm always fascinated by your story and your journey and uh, how you made a career out of the military. And um, I'm excited that we can share that story with our students. And I think the best place to start is the beginning, if you don't mind, and how you, how you entered the military. Great, the beginning's always a good place to start. Um, I finished high school um, in 1971. Um, I was a bit of a, a, a math geek at the time. Um, engineering was in my genes, so it was my desire to pursue engineering in some fashion. Um, I applied to only two colleges. I applied to North Carolina State University and the U.S. Naval Academy. Um, I was fortunate to receive an appointment to the U.S. Naval Academy. Graduated from Navy in 1975, uh, B.S. in Mechanical Engineering. Um, my uh, career path selection was surface warfare, which is Navy ships. Um, after a, a, a year and a half or thereabouts of, of schooling, um, I ended up, uh, uh, I'd won the lottery, I ended up as the anti-submarine warfare officer aboard the Navy's anti-submarine warfare test ship. Hmm. So um, USS Canole FF-1056, that was a time when our enemy was, uh, and this was the Cold War enemy, uh, were the Soviets. Um, we spent lots of time doing really, really cool things with underwater acoustics. Um, I had an incredible experience over three years, deployed to the Mediterranean a couple of times, chasing Soviet submarines. Thereafter, Canole went into the shipyard up at Bath, Maine. I met the young lady that eventually became my wife. Wanda was a aviation intelligence officer with a, a P-3 squadron. So um, P-3 was the aviation end of the business that I was in as a, a surface ship guy. She, um, she was in the business of chasing Soviet submarines. So uh, we, we actually had that bit of geekness, if you will, in common. Um, we ended up at uh, in the next set of orders. Uh, the detailers uh, smiled at us and sent us both to Patuxent River, Maryland, Naval Air Station, uh, Patuxent River, Maryland. That's the, um, uh, there were a lot of functions, Navy functions that were um, taking place at, at Pax River, uh, operational as well as test and otherwise. <coughs> I ended up with a helicopter test program. I was not an aviator, uh, but I did have vast experience. Um, time out. <laughs> My apologies. All good. Um, so you were, you were not an aviator. I was, I was not an aviator. Um, by virtue of my experience with chasing submarines, um, the, um, the system that was under test was the Navy's brand new shipboard anti-submarine warfare helicopter system. Um, high tech, digital, data link, yada yada. Um, when you chase submarines, you move a lot of data back and forth. Uh, and so I got to go through that program uh, with the latter stages of, of the test piloting stuff, um, but then completely, and that was pretty much um, my benefit there was becoming familiar with the system. Um, I then was test director for the operational test stuff, um, which meant that we went to sea with a couple of airframes and with a couple of U.S. submarines at our disposal 
and did things that ships and helicopters do to try to locate submarines. Um, <coughs> after that time, after that tour was over, um, my wife and I, my new wife and I, uh, each received a new set of orders um, and we were sent in opposite directions. It's just the way things worked out. The Navy's purpose is not to offer jobs or offer family wholeness, but rather to defend the country. So uh, we, were, we were sent in different directions. That's that a tremendous the, sacrifice. <coughs> thank you. Um, it would have been had I made it, but we chose to, to get out. I actually got out before she did and became her trailing dependent, as we say in the Navy, um, for a few months. We, we couldn't make the situation work there either, so she got out of the Navy. <coughs> Fast forward, um, Juan and I ended up with uh, three children. Um, the oldest boy, um, uh, ended up at U.S. Military Academy at West Point, New York. It's got to um, make the Army Navy game an interesting uh, time. In yes, your but I, I got to say that during his four years at West Point, West Point never won the Army <laughs> Navy game. But I've got to, I've got to toss out that plug. Um, and to this day, he he cries about that. Um, my middle child uh, in. The summer of the spring of 05, 2005, received an appointment to the Naval Academy. Uh, so, not to be ones to miss an opportunity, my wife and I moved from North Carolina, where we were at that point, up to Philadelphia, literally so we could be available to host Army Navy tailgate parties uh, once fantastic. a year. That's fantastic. And um, so, we had a two two year overlap. There was a two year period during which. Um, we had a boy at each of the schools. Um, for many years after that, um, our house here in Exton became a, a way station for West Point cadets and, and Naval Academy midshipmen that were traveling through the area. Um, so for many years, we've maintained close contact with lots of, of future military officers. Um, my daughter, who was several years off the back, graduated from Virginia Tech, ROTC, Army ROTC, um, currently is active duty, received or, or came back from her first deployment to the Mideast not too many months ago. Um, she's married to Cody, who is, Cody is a Marine pilot in training. They haven't lived together for almost two years now, the two years wow. they've been married because of the military separation. <coughs> I also have a daughter-in-law that's married to my middle son, the naval officer, uh, who is, uh, Audrey is a veteran herself. She was enlisted in the Navy, is no longer. Um, so as of today, my oldest boy is off active duty. My middle son is uh, in his 11th year of being a naval officer. He's a surface a nuclear engineer, which means that he runs the power plant on aircraft carriers. <clears throat> Currently stationed aboard the USS Abe Lincoln, who is two months past their um, uh, initially promulgated return home from deployment date because the USS Truman, who was, their, was scheduled to be their relief on station, had some engineering issues which had been overcome and it looks like Sam will get home right after Christmas, right after Christmas. So, yeah, <clears throat> he will be home, but we think it'll be right after Christmas. Um, which I, I've got to add in that that's one of the things that we celebrate veterans for or, or military for are the concessions they make and the challenges that they live up against. In this case, Sam's got two small children living back in San Diego, wow. and he hasn't had the opportunity to be with them in quite a while, and, and he will be separated for a while. At any rate, it's what he signed up for. He knows that, and he accepts the challenge. And, and it, it is a tremendous sacrifice for which we're all <laughs> incredibly grateful as, as folks that, that hadn't participated and made the military choice. And I'm, I'm curious, um, 
you know, somebody had, um, it would have applied to these multiple schools, so you, you could have went with NC State and you could have went with the United States Navy. Steve, why did you make the military choice? Um, at the time, I, I chose the military because it was a, a top-level education. Um, it gave me a chance to serve my country as well. Um, having lived through multiple iterations of family members <coughs> committing to the military, um, it's pretty clear to me there are many benefits, but the two that by far are the ones that I'm choosing to stand on the mountaintop and shout about um, are the um, continuing education, and, and I'm not I'm not paid to make that plug. That's from my heart. Um, I, every member of my family has received the top level college education compliments of the U.S. government. Okay, but it doesn't end there. Um, it it continues. Um, Military people spend more time in school than you could ever imagine. Many of those uh, schools are uh, very job specific, um, but all in all, they make you a better person. The other thing, and this is this is in in my judgment and my humble judgment, the single biggest attribute of being in the military is it helps you in every way possible to develop a career, to develop a resume, if you will. Um, I don't care what a person has done in the military. If they've been in the military for any length of time, they've got a pretty incredible resume built up. Um, I think that people in the military, because of the way the military culture is organized, People in the military handled much bigger responsibility much earlier than they would in any fashion outside of the military. And, and that, that responsibility includes budgetary responsibility, schedule responsibility, technical responsibility, leadership responsibility, and I could go on. All of that translates very, very readily to documentation that says, I can do just about any job, okay? Um, the, I, I personally believe that an individual with a military background will never want for um, employment on the outside. It's a beautiful thing. Thank you. Um, a lot of what, what we've been discussing in terms of your military <clears throat> experience is maybe not necessarily what uh, folks would readily think about immediately when they hear the word military. You're talking about engineering and, uh, uh, you know, uh, you had mentioned uh, underwater uh, engineering and chasing after submarines and that there's, there's a lot of, you know, aircraft and on the surface and beneath the surface and there's there's a lot of highly technical pieces to what it is that you're discussing, uh, as well as I'm thinking about like all the roles that must support that happening, like just to get a ship <clears throat> moving. Th there's so many folks <clears throat> that have to be staffed in very highly technical ways. Can you speak to perhaps the, uh, I don't want to say the changing face of the military because that's, that, that's not fair. <clears throat> it's kind of always been that way. Um, the, the beyond the surface, uh, life of military and the different varied kinds of training that you can get? Um, yeah, good good question. I'm not, not sure where to start, so if you would be patient with me, I'm going to ramble for just a little bit. By all means. Um, the, in terms of formal education, um, there are many programs um, supported throughout the military that allow one to get a college education and, and a free education. There are many programs throughout the military <clears throat> that 
allow one to get a graduate degree while one is on active duty. And many of those programs, um, once, you, once you qualify for the program as a Navy employee or an Army employee or an Air Force employee, uh, your acquisition of your graduate degree is considered your day job while you're doing that. In other words, uh, if you get into a master's program in the Navy, um, and, and I, I've got to add in, Dr. Podell and I were talking earlier today, um, there are uh, any number of young folks from this school system who are currently in their master's program um, at the benefit of the, the U.S. military. Um, so it's a real thing, it's not an advertisement. At any rate, for the, for the year, year and a half, two years that one is, is getting that graduate degree, military pays, it's your day job, you get all benefits, um, yada yada. And then when you get that educational step behind you, you're, you're back to driving a ship or driving a submarine or driving a, a, a military aircraft or whatever it is you do. That's remarkable. Um, so that's that's kind of the formal end of, or the yeah, the formal end of education. But I, you know, every year, every every month, Navy people, Army people, Air Force people are are in in a class of of some fashion. They're learning to fight fires. They're learning to operate a, a console. They're learning to um, uh, operate a new software update that's come out. Um, they're, they're going to a safety class. They're going to a class for some collateral duty. Maybe it's your job to um, uh, maintain the, the boat that goes over the side to, uh, you know, to do whatever utility function. Um, there's a school you go to for that. And, and so when your ship is deployed, there's ongoing informal education on the ship. When your ship rotates back or your unit rotates back from deployment, all members of the, of the unit are, are farmed out to various schools, not all the time, but you know a good percentage of the time, you're in a formal class. Sometimes it's a three-day class about whatever, and sometimes it's a, a three-month class about a different topic. But the, um, there's a lot of on-the-job training, but most of, the, most of that on-the-job education is prefaced by some classroom time. <coughs> much of that uh, education, much of that experience, uh, translates to the kind of experience that outside employers uh, find attractive. The, uh, I'd also like to comment on the, um, uh, the technological status, if you will, of the military because I think operating in that environment contributes greatly to one uh, being a better qualified person. Um, my Army son and I frequently talk about whether my Navy background or his Army background was in a richer environment technically. <clears throat> there was a time for many, many years through the 70s, through the 80s, uh, well into the 90s, when much or, or, or most of the cutting edge technological development in the U.S. that was occurring was occurring on military budget. In other words, technology was advanced for military purposes and uh, the commercial sector kind of rode the, the side benefits of that. Like the internet. The, the internet is, is the perfect example. Um, so you, you clearly are aware of yeah. what I'm pointing at here. Um, but the, that, that same kind of thing is true in, I mean, dozens of areas. Uh, 
material technology, uh, chemistry, medicine. Army, Army was cutting edge for, for medicine when, when we go off to war and we have people that have, uh, you know, lots of people that have injuries, gruesome injuries. Um, there were, you know, the Army created ways to do that and to make that person whole again in the absence of, of defined protocols. So for, for many, many, many years, uh, many decades, the military was the, uh, at, the, at the forefront of technological advancement all across the board. Um, and so being, being a part of that world, um, you learn. I was uh, um, anti-submarine warfare officer aboard the Navy's ASW test ship and we had a, a number of unique, one-of-a-kind systems, and those one-of-a-kind implies that uh, they were breadboard, probably jimmied up by a scientist someplace, and put to sea um, with science, uh, you know, science and engineer, engineering people on staff of the ship um, to to uh, work with that breadboard system and make notes and redesign and, yeah. and so forth. And those kinds of systems were actually used during the Cold War to chase bad guys with. Um, fast forward, they do some incredible things out there these days with underwater acoustics and, and, and other technologies. So there, there's there's a lot that you've described about um, your military service, and I I see the the animated nature with which you do. So I'm I'm curious, what was your favorite part about being in the United States Navy? Oh, that's easy. Um, that one's going to light me up now. I um I love driving a ship. Now that may sound trivial. Um, it's um it's the ultimate team sport, if you will. Um, you, you know, you play basketball, you play football, you play whatever. You're in a dynamic environment and it's important that you know what's going on over here and over here and what the challenge is and, and, and what's going on back there. Driving a ship's the same way. You're standing up on the bridge. You've got a lot of power at your disposal. You've got eight different radios, if you will, speakers, each different network. Um, and, and, and just by virtue of where you hear the conversation, if you're sharp, you, you know which circuit that is, so you know what kind of information it is, and it's all kind of equal in volume, and it would probably make anyone go crazy that's not used to it. But you're picking out what you need. You've got information coming up from the Combat Information Center down below telling you where the channel is or where the bad guys That's are or where the other ships are. And it's, it's, uh, it's overwhelming information. Um, and you intensely get into it and you do what it is you're supposed to do and you come out the other side and you just feel crazy about it because it's just awesome. Uh, Bridge Watch team has... Uh, back in my day, about 18 people on a bridge watch team. So in a in a, a room that was 50 feet wide and 20 feet deep, you had a bunch of bodies each doing their own thing as inputs to me as I drove the ship. It was challenging. It helped me be a better person, but it was the ultimate team sport. And boy, when you crossed the finish line, you really felt like spiking the football, let me tell you. I miss driving the ship more than I miss any other part of having been in the U.S. Navy. And, and now you're at a point in your career where you're helping to onboard <clears throat> folks that are interested in the United States Navy. If you could talk about uh, the work that you're currently doing yes, sir. To, as and, a liaison. And, and thanks for bringing me back into that. I, um, when I talked earlier about my, my career path, um, <clears throat> that's kind of the, the capstone, if you will. For about the last 25 years, um, more or less, I've been involved with the U.S. Naval Academy's uh, um, uh, field admissions effort, if you will. Um, I'm what's referred to as a blue and gold officer or a Naval Academy information program officer, I think is the formal nomenclature. 
<laughs> We're big fans of blue I, and gold in Downingtown, by the way. I, I spend a, a goodly amount of time um, engaging high school students um, to talk about military opportunities. My, my thrust specifically is Naval Academy, um, but I'm also equipped to discuss the other services if need be. Um, and to discuss ROTC, which I think is a wonderful program. Service academies aren't for everyone for a multitude of reasons. Um, ROTC really, really fills a huge gap. Um, a, lot of, a lot of frontline colleges across the United States that have reserve officer training commission programs. If I'm a young person watching this now, and I'm curious about opportunities for me in the military or <clears throat> thinking about making the military choice, what advice do you have? Um, the, uh, um, I, I think that first thing one needs to look at is, do I want to go in as an officer or do I want to go in as enlisted? And they each have benefits, okay? Um, I, I think there are a number of folks that choose to go in as enlisted because they may think perhaps I'm not ready for college yet, emotionally or financially or otherwise. <clears throat> I need some time to mature. The military certainly helps one mature. Um, but one also accrues veterans benefits while one is serving on active duty and what that means is after you, if you, if you choose to go um, for a shorter term on active duty, um, you can then get out, go to college, and, and life continues on. And so you have the benefit of government paying for college, plus I was four years more mature when I went to college, plus I had four years of technical experience behind me when I did go to college. So there's that. Um, um, the officer route, gives you opportunities to pay for college right away. ROTC uh, has one of the best scholarships in the land that can be applied to schools all across the U.S. They must be ROTC schools, but there are lots of those. Service academies, uh, um, uh, very, very challenging in terms of uh, admissions and application, but it, it happens uh, for lots of people. Um, that education is worth, um, that scholarship is worth half a million dollars. So it's it's nothing to nothing to sneeze at. Um, I think if one is going to go the enlisted route, one needs to talk to a recruiter, but one needs to do some homework before you talk to that recruiter. Um, don't don't go in and. Uh, and and not know what it is you're you're there to to purchase, if you will. Um, <clears throat> if if you're interested in an ROTC program or a service academy, um, and there are four of those. There's the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. There's the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, New York. Uh, there's the U.S. Air Force Academy at Colorado Springs, Colorado. And there's the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, which is in southeastern New York. Um, those are all full scholarship programs. They're competitive for admission. Um, but for both the ROTC program and the service academies, <coughs> one, one needs to begin application toward the end of one's junior year. The, the uh, Application process is longer and more bureaucratic than perhaps a, a, a nominal college application, so it does start a little earlier. Um, there is a an individual um, assigned to Downingtown East um, as well as West and STEM to to operate as a candidate liaison for anyone that's interested in in Naval Academy, um, and that name and contact information can um, can be had from Mrs. Wick. Um, she has that information available. Awesome. Um, I'm going to ask 
one more question of you, Stephen. Sure. Thank you. You've been so generous with your time. It's how I punctuate all of these <clears throat> uh, career cafe interviews. You've got 17-year-old Steve Curley by the shoulders. What do you tell him? If I could speak to myself when I was 17 years old, I think my thrust would be regarding taking best advantage of best opportunities. One can't take advantage of all opportunities in this day and time, but when one commits, one needs to commit and one needs to see it through the end. I, there, were, there were a few opportunities in my life that I didn't pursue efficiently, and perhaps there were a few that I abandoned. If I had that to do over again, um, I, I think I would tr probably make an effort uh, to be a little truer to the legitimate priority. Profound wisdom with which we can end our segment today. And, and Steve, I want to thank you so very much for being here. Thank you. You're an absolute treasure to our community, and thank you so much for your service to our country. Thank you, sir. The pleasure is mine. Folks, that'll about do it for us here on the Career Cafe. Please have a wonderful rest of your day.